good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunrise Daily Today. I'm Chamberlain Osor. Indeed, a beautiful Friday morning to you here at Maupe Ogun Yusuf. All right, so take a look at that. It's a Friday morning. Yes, it's 26 degrees centigrade here in Abuja. Humidity is 79%. But what you see right there, look, since it's a Friday, you might have happy campus. That is Usuma Dam. That is uh, one lovely scenario, very peaceful area. It takes you away from the hustle and bustle of Lagos. I mean, uh, people go there. Did, did you say Lagos? Lagos, pardon? <laughs> Abuja, of the city center, of the city area. I know. So, uh, yes, indeed. But look, if you have to go to areas like this, because they do exist. Yeah. So you need to go there with your water, your food, because chances are that you might not get it there when you go in there. But boat club, Abuja boat club folks go there a lot. So it's a lovely scenario. Just, yeah, that's how you get a mix of nature. It's not just all about, you know, blaring horns and all over the area, but look at the serenity. It's Indeed. lovely. Beautiful and picturesque. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing you these pictures, perhaps giving you ideas of what to do this weekend in case you're bored with the city. It could even be the city of Lagos, which you're tired of. One flight, you're just one flight away, and you land in Abuja, and you can make your way to the Usuma Dam, mm -hmm. constructed in 1990 yep. uh, for the people, for the residents of Abuja, to supply water to the FCT. And that's what you see there. It's one of the very, very attractive tourist attractions right here in the Federal Capital Territory. What a way to end the week. Over now to you, Ayo. What do you have for us? You want to visit the dam, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, good morning. And um, this is really a lovely place, no doubt about it. Um, for some people looking at it now, guys, whether you like it or not, all they can see is business. <laughs> I mean, it's just a lovely sight. No, who's going to believe that this is in Nigeria? Away from all of the <laughs> gory pictures that people show. This is indeed lovely, guys, and it's just amazing. It is just amazing. And I know there are several places like this in the city in Nigeria. But this is Lagos, guys. Come down to reality. This is Lagos. Um, uh, two modes of transportation you can see. The major road that goes up your screen that goes straight to um, Oyibo and to your right goes straight to Jualegba, to Tejosho area. And uh, two modes of road transportation right there, your own private vehicles. And that white uh, cover you see there is for the uh, BRT system that Lagos has. And behind that white uh, canopy you see is a rail service right there in the heart of Lagos, Yaba to be precise. That famous Yaba bus stop? Well, those uh, guys selling stuff along the rail line, you can't see them anymore, can you? This is Lagos, guys. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ayo Makinde. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. Indeed, Ayo, Lagos is significantly different, especially Yaba, because for many, many years, uh, living in Lagos, I do recall, I mean, also as a student there, the Yaba bus stop was a very famous place for students of the University of Lagos, where we used to go and queue mm -hmm. uh, to get access to Akoka, where our school was situated. Well, Chimelin can relate. I mean, it's always very wonderful <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doing a program with your fellow Akokites. <laughs> but I never looked left a lot. I always <laughs> No, no one wants but, to look at Yaba left. Uh, well, for we those should who pay don't... some attention to now that <laughs> mental health is a thing. I mean, don't let people let you re refer you to Yaba left. But Yaba right. It was where the bus stop was, and look at how significantly it's changed. It is good to see some Absolutely. development in Lagos, indeed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, let's go ahead now and talk to you about some of the events that you expect, uh, you should expect today. For instance, it's World Consumer Rights Day. So, the Communications Commission, uh, they will be doing something about that. Well, okay doing something, I use that advisedly. They're supposed to mark it. But, you know, the reason why this even happens globally, 
is to create awareness about the rights of the consumers that exist, which can be protected from discrimination, unfair practices and exploitation. And I know if you tell consumers to send you the experience now, I wonder where that leaves the NCC. Uh, how much have they been upholding those rights? I know time was when we focused a lot about ensuring that the drop calls, the quality of the calls is reduced to the barest minimum. And if anything untoward happens, all those people who barge into your privacy send you all sorts. But uh, NCC, I know they have to uh, up the game, to say the least. Indeed, that's not even with what has been happening this last couple of days where people oh. have not been able to, um, you know, get access to the internet. You know, yesterday we heard the news that um, on the sea cables were yeah. affected as a result, affecting, um, you know, com communication um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and access to the internet. I don't know if that's under the purview of the NCC. Is it, is it under the purview um. now? Because there is now, the, is it digital, Ministry of Digital... Communica is it communication and digital affairs also? Yeah. And then you now also have the NCC. Would, would that be under the, because I mean, they are in charge of spectrum, etc. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and there's been that argument about between NCC and NBC. Whether yeah. or not the NCC should be a unit in the NBC uh, because in the of NBC, the spectrum exactly, licensing. Exactly, exactly. Like but they can always work together. It, it, Indeed, it's, uh, they can. And, and when you think of the fact that network providers yeah. are directly supervised by the NCC, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of people, you know, get their services from. Internet services are usually provided by uh, network providers, those who provide uh, communication services as well. Mm, you know, telephonic communication If I could also services. add to that, some of the uh, issues that the telcos have raised mm -hmm. is how construction folks just damage their cables and that happens consistently it affects the quality of course i don't know if they can describe that as an excuse but they say that's a fact so how the ncc factors that in remains to be seen but bottom line is uh, they also did say look i think ncc needs to also help in pushing for the bill to be passed such that if it's criminalized they know they have to be a little more cautious and do the right things such that you don't just cut those cables and the consumers be just keep getting the short end of the stick so all of those collaboration are things that should be take we take for granted but apparently it's a big deal it is a big deal and it should be a big deal uh, sometimes even as an ordinary nigerian you're scandalized the way you see construction companies destroy certain things yeah. and do not think about how you know they will need to at least maybe do a palliative portion for consumers to be able to pass or something i have yeah. seen uh you know roads that were properly built destroyed because they wanted to get something through it and not even thinking about the fact that cars are still passing that particular road so there needs to be a little more thought yeah. and a little more intention yes at the end of the day it's for the good of everybody but in the meantime, let us put some thoughts to how we do certain things uh, that we do, knowing that it could affect other services that these same people whom we seek to serve are going to be using. I uh, wonder what's happening in Lagos today. Well, not just Lagos. There's another one in Abuja about security, guys. Uh, is that the meeting of the IGP with the Ministry of, uh, Police Minister of Police Affairs? That's yeah, right. We understand that, as well. that is also happening today. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, indeed. Security is indeed on the front burner, as it should be. Uh, don't forget that the kidnappings in Kuriga are still very much on the front burner and we're waiting whilst uh, the, the, the federal government has said that it will not pay ransom. It has also given marching orders uh, to the security chiefs to ensure that the children who were taken from the school in Kuriga and also in Sokoto, you know, are returned to their families. So it will be interesting to know the outcome of the meeting between the Minister of Police Affairs and the IGP uh, that will be happening today. Ayo. I mean, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see how all of that goes because at the end of the day, these things are about people. The, f the two issues that you guys have raised are very, very connected in my opinion because uh, you're talking about telcos and all. By the way, that ministry you're talking about, you're trying to remember about where is uh, the Ministry of Digital Economy Innovation and, um, and uh, dig dig you know, communications, innovation and digital economy, whichever one comes first. But you know, the, the important thing there is a collaboration that needs to happen with states. Whatever happened that people haven't been able to do business the way they normally do business, 
it's definitely an international thing and i'm sure that the authorities at various levels they are looking at that so that is all cut up for them but when you talk about people cutting the roads indiscriminately i think that behoves on the state's authorities to ensure that those things don't happen now in lagos it's an it's it's against the law and there are very stringent measures around that in Lagos today. I don't know of any other states or where, how it happens elsewhere. We ought to be able to take responsibility for the things that we do. And they're talking about all those, uh, you know, what happened, you know, on, under the seas and all. Such things have been happening in the Niger Delta as well, where people just vandalize uh, oil installations anyhow. On business news today, of course, we all remember that the president signed on some executive orders on the oil and gas um, industry and that is what we are the business news on sunrise daily this morning will be looking at taking a closer look at the executive orders on oil and gas that's up at 10 o'clock this morning now let's go take a look at what's happening on the papers today We'll start with Nigerian Tribune here. Insecurity as a theme here. NSA, security chiefs, northern governors meet. Military working with foreign partners to rescue abducted citizens from the defense headquarters. That's a big lead right there. So uh, that will be Tribune today. Well, taking a look at Daily Trust now, you see the... The lead story on the front page of Daily Trust, budget padding, insertions by National Assembly legal. Um, that's according to Bagudu. Akpabio won't resign, Senate spokesman replies PDP. Principal officers received over 200 million naira. That's according to Ndume. Atiku demands probes. So the PDP isn't letting up. Uh, the story is on page four of the paper. Don't forget that as a result of Senator Ningi's uh, assertions now, the PDP has asked the Senate President to step aside for a thorough investigation. The presidential candidate of the party is also speaking up, adding his voice to it. But this is what we're getting from the Minister of um, National Planning saying insertions by National Assembly are legal, but you know, to what extent uh, are, are they legal? I think it has to be the question uh, people are asking. Page four is where you want to get details of that particular story. Let's leave it there for Daily Trust. Independent this morning is bringing us some kind of reminder. I mean, we've been talking about the Port Harcourt refineries for a while. Well, here is another assurance. Port Harcourt refinery to start operation in two weeks from no lesser person than the group chief executive officer of the NNPCL. Details on the front page, continuous on the inside pages. Is it safe to say, let the countdown begin? That's the Daily Independent this morning. Well, look at uh, Nigerian News Direct. On the sea, cable cut cripples bank digital channels, business operations. I know the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy also did say, I beg your pardon, Minister of Digital Economy, right? They say um, Nigeria now needs to, or government needs to have foot at the door in this regard, so that uh, you don't rely just on that. The under subsea cable that we currently have. If FG steps in, the target is to see how we can reduce the cost. Of connectivity so government agencies can easily be connected schools can be connected I tell you that will be one major step that the country can indeed take to leapfrog some of these challenges and get us into uh, at least the next phase so maybe sooner rather than later Ayo, that countdown can begin take a look at the vanguard this morning it's not um, well at least the way of keeping is on the front burner 287 Kaduna students abductors demand 1 billion naira vow to kill victims in 20 days and that's a late story on the front page of Vanga newspapers well that's not what the Nigerian military thinks the Nigerian military maintains that because the numbers of these terrorists are getting decimated that they are now kidnapping um, ordinary citizens particularly vulnerable groups to use as human shield 
so that they can protect their numbers, uh, their vulnerable numbers. That's what the Nigerian, the Nigerian military has said in its, in its communication to Nigerians. They've also asked the media not to give oxygen to those groups. But this, uh, their response is also here in, in this um, rider here. Military vows to rescue school children says abduction succeeded because the military was not notified on time. Notes the school children taken to terrain difficult to access. Uh, explains reasons for upsurge in mass abduction. NSCDC working with others to secure release of Kaduna students. Okay, it's a good thing to hear the NSCDC CGC. <laughs> FCT to use drones to track kidnappers. It's according to Wiki. 19 Northern Governors NSA Service Chiefs meet on possible review of security architecture. The story is on page 5 of the paper. Uh, we'll leave it there for Vanguard newspapers. The Nigerian Observer is calling attention to something that's likely to happen in another 27 years from now, 26 years from now. 150 thousand Nigerian residents under threat of rising sea levels by 2050 as according to a research because guess what 1.3 million are threatened in China 1.2 in India and 310,000 are under the same threat in the US where is that coming from the details you find on the front page and it continues on page two of the Nigerian Observer this morning all right, so just a quick one on uh, sticks out. Jackpa on modern slavery. How UK visa system deportation risk... No, I'll go again. How UK visa system deportation risk silence exploited care workers, the Guardian. So you can just see all of that on the front page here this morning, as you can see uh, on the front page. So security is uh, one of the key areas that we're going to be focusing on this morning as... Uh, I've been highlighted in some dailies, so that is what we will look at. And so I think since I've already in some of the dailies, mm -hmm. we'll focus on that in a moment. All right, so that wraps it up. We'll look at some of the dailies here this morning. We're back in a moment. Stay on with us. Digestion? Try Just Eat. My recommendation for the past 26 years, Just Eat. Reliable remedy for heartburn, indigestion, flatulence, and acidity. Do you know that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only, you get 50 invites. 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp, and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design, and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 0913 1565 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable health care for all the family at all times.
Madonna University, Nigeria, invites you to her Silver Jubilee celebration. It is the first private and Catholic university in Nigeria. As a build-up, it will be hosting the IFCU conference from the 17th to the 19th of March, 2024, at 9 a.m. daily. The grand finale for the Silver Jubilee celebration will hold on the 20th of March, 2024, at 9 a.m. All events will hold at the University Auditorium of Madonna University, Elele, River State. Special guest of honor, His Excellency, President Ola Ahmed Tinubu, GCFR, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Distinguished speaker and guest of honor, Right Honorable Benjamin Kalu, Deputy Speaker of House of Representative, Keynote Speaker, Most Reverend Matthew Hassan Puka, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Host, Very Reverend Father, Professor EMP, Ede, Founder and Chancellor, Madonna University, Nigeria. Highlights for the event will be book launch, paper presentation, and awards. Madonna University, Nigeria, Silver Jubilee Celebration, a university with a difference. It's the third federal executive meeting of the year, and it starts with the swearing-in of the new commissioners of the National Population Commission. <laughs> President Bola Tinubu is presiding over the ceremony as the commissioners step forward in batches for the exercise. <laughs> After the ceremony, the council meeting moves into a closed-door session. A recent spate of abductions in the northern part of the country features during the meeting. We are seeing some kind of uh, uh, movement by the, the more the security agencies are also hitting these targets, uh, the, the targets of criminals, the more they are, they are pushed to also getting some uh, soft targets. But government is not taking any excuses. The, the president has directed that security agencies must, as a matter of urgency, ensure that these children and all those who have been kidnapped are brought back to, in safety. And government is not paying anybody any, any dime. And the government is optimistic that um, these children and other people that are abducted will be brought back to their families in safety. The Minister of Agriculture gave an update on the federal government's distribution of grains across the country. We're distributing to state capitals in the first instance now. Um, as you all are aware, um, the risks are involved in uh, uh, vandalization of uh, food stuff in transit. So um, we're working assiduously, assiduously with, with the Office of the National Security Advisor and the DSS and the police. And uh, as I can assure you, um, we have started distributing, especially in the northwest, with northwestern states. We're distributing out of seven points. Council also approved the setting up of a $2 billion you, fund uh, for a 120-kilometer fiber optic cable across the country. The president is giving the go-ahead for us to source funds for that. So we are in the process of setting up a $2 billion, $2 billion fund. I said it costs less than $1 billion. But the reason why we're setting up the $2 billion fund is to use the balance to drive down the cost of connectivity in the country. We want to ensure that all schools are connected, all hospitals in the country, country that, that they are connected, and also all government facilities as well. The Minister of Works also addressed concerns that his push for companies to build concrete roads could be responsible for the rising cost of cement. The policy uh, has not even taken off uh, you know, very well because you should ask yourself how many roads today are being done on concrete. Uh, but the truth remains that with the cost of beauty men now, contractors are begging that their projects should be reviewed on uh, concrete. 
State House correspondents were also informed that the president is not stopping or suspending the student loan scheme, but that the scheme is being revamped and a new date will be announced for its launch. From the presidential villa, Lanre Lassese, Channels Television News. All right, welcome back. Yes, indeed, uh, we'll be talking about security and some of the matters here this morning. As you may have seen, we're joined by Senator Abdulaziz Musa Yaradwa. He is the chairman, Senate Committee on Army, and also the new chairman, Northern Senators Forum. Good morning, Senator. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning, Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. So, Good having morning. emerged as the chairman, Northern Senators Forum, considering how the whole scenario, uh, what transpired before your emergence, What's your thinking about how you are going to approach that new role? Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this forum, uh, the Northern Senators Forum, was established you know, to promote the unity of Nigeria. And uh, I think that is how I'm going to approach you know, uh, this new role that I'm going to play. And I tell you that uh, we are going to work with the leaders of the Southern Senators Forum to ensure that we promote this unity and we, we try to bridge the gap as well as, uh, you know, strengthen the diversity that, that exists between us as Nigerians. And um, I tell you that in the Senate, we work as a family, uh, especially when the Senate President, uh, His Excellency Godswill Akpabio, when he was elected, uh, one of the first principles, you know, he uh, put into our minds was that you know, the moment you enter the chamber, you know, you are no longer, you know, senator from your own senatorial zone, but you are a senator of the Federal Republic. And I think that is how we work in the Senate. So as a family, I think uh, most importantly, we must promote, first and foremost, the unity of this nation, you know, uh, strengthen the diversity. As, as you know, these are some of the issues, you know, bedeviling the nation. And um, the whole essence is to look at the challenges the North is facing, uh, work with our colleagues from the South so that they can help us, you know, uh, pass whatever we want uh, that will uh, promote the development of, of the North. And uh, by extension, we also cooperate with the executive arm of government because uh, you have to lobby in democracy. And uh, that is the whole essence so that we get things done. Uh, I'm aware as you are, uh, the most important challenge today, not only in the north, but also in you know all other parts of the nation, is the issue of security. Yeah. So we have to work uh, as a Senate uh, to ensure that uh, this issue of security is uh, brought to the barest minimum, uh, you know, so that you know development can take place in the country. Uh, I want to mention that we must understand that Nigeria is at war. We are at war with bandits. We are at war with Boko Haram. And uh, internal security or intern, uh, uh, internal security operations, uh, as you know, are ongoing in 30, basically 35 states and the FCT by the army. So basically, Nigeria is at war with bandits, kidnappers, uh, as well as, as other criminal elements. So it is important for the country to know that we need to shift our attention very well on security. So, as chairman Senate Committee on the Army, having served in the Army yourself, so there's a lot of perspectives uh, that you will have on this matter. What, how do you relate, especially uh, probably when lots of people keep wondering or keep thinking security agencies, if they're not doing enough or need to do more, and then the recent commentary from the executive saying, no ransom payments in there and do a job. Well, let me take us back to, back to history a little bit. You see, first we have to understand the landmass of this nation. We have almost 1 million square kilometers of landmass. We have to also take into consideration, I'm happy my elder brother, distinguished uh, Senator Ndume, I think was here recently in one of the uh, interviews he had. He did mention, you know, the issue of the strength of the military we have and other security agencies that put, put, if you put all of them together, they are not up to one million. In a country of 220 million 
you know, people. So first of all, we have to understand we have a problem of the strength of the military and the police and other security agencies that we have that they cannot really police and secure this nation. We must understand that. And I know the president, uh, His Excellency Bola Ahmed Tinubu, is working on the need you know, to recruit more military, more police, so that uh, at least we, we do as much as possible to deal with the insecurity situation. Yeah. So, yeah, but Senator, pardon me to jump in. Is it about us recruiting? Because if we recruit as the security architecture is presently constituted, there might just be marginal difference. Isn't it also about us considering redesigning the security architecture of the country? Yes, of course, we have to redesign the security architecture. I agree. But you see, uh, this type of insurgency that we are fighting, you really need a lot of uh, uh, the strength of the army and, and that of the police and other military uh, agencies must be increased. Uh, first of all, you know that uh, the number of forests we have in Nigeria where these criminals have enclaves are up to almost 100 different forest reserves in the country. If you look at the northwest, uh, the latest statistics we had, uh, you know, from uh, uh, civil society and some security experts, was that we have over 30,000, you know, bandits and kidnappers, and they have over 100, you know, enclaves spread all across. So you look at it that the strength of the army that we have cannot really move in, because when you move from Kazana State, for example, you try to route them out, they move into Zamfara State. From Zamfara, if you try anything, they move to Kebi, they move out to Kaduna and Niger. So what the security agencies are doing, especially the army, you know, is to try to conduct a holistic uh, operations to see how they can be routed out. But you see, the, one of the challenges is that it's not we always concentrate on the kinetic. The non-kinetic uh, approach is very, very important. And I think that is what this government is trying to do, uh, especially with the, uh, the Ruga, the current Ruga uh, approach that they want to use in ensuring that they get to the grassroots to provide social services. Because the whole essence is we do not have development at the grassroots. And where these bandits go to recruit is at the grassroots, in the rural areas. How is Ruga going to solve that? Well, you see, it will help in ensuring that those basic needs that are required at the, at the grassroots are provided. Isn't that what governors and local governments are all there for? If you strengthen yeah, that it's, level it's of governance... Of course, it is in collaboration with them. You know, it is in collaboration with the governors. Uh, the, the most important thing we must know is the local governments are not working. You know that. So we have to work, especially in this 10th uh, assembly, to ensure that you know the local governments get their autonomy. If they do, I believe the level of security we are going to have will go, will increase. So I think, on on the whole, we have to look at the deficit we have in terms of the strength of the security forces, and also, like you said, the security architecture must be improved by bringing in the traditional institutions. They have been left behind, and we know how organized. They are in terms of their own security architecture. Bringing them under the local government has made the traditional institutions, you know, to be, you know, uh, quiet. And if you go to the grassroots, you'll discover that if you have a, a, a personnel of the Department of Security Service, you see maybe only one person covers about two to three local governments in terms of gathering intelligence. But if you look at the traditional institution, if you have even a house in, in a village, mm. or, or two or three houses, yeah. the emir has what we call a ward head and other village heads, district heads, but, you know, that have intelligence that flows through up to the but, emir. But, but, but Senator, what would you say to those who think, yes, they hear the point that you're trying to make, but if, for instance, they address some of the narratives out there that they need to, first of all, 
let deal with informants who are within the army and then deal with those who for instance you're about to go on operations we heard several times the army ambushed this is intel that leaks from somewhere so if those issues are addressed and then we approach this with coordination in, within the security agencies themselves will achieve way much more than we're achieving now to the extent that probably some of these issues may not even be high up there yeah you are right but i tell you uh, recently i'm sure you've heard of, of the successes that the army mm -hmm. uh, has been having in terms of uh, killing a lot of the bandit uh, leaders this is as a result of the intelligence uh, you know i i sponsored a motion on the floor of the senate some months ago the respect of the need for the security agencies to improve on their synergy because we discovered that uh, the coordination among the security agencies was not as it should be and that was what led to us inviting the head of the security agencies in the country you know to to hear from them and uh, to hear their challenges and to encourage them you know to you know to 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 encourage them to have that synergy and coordination so that intelligence can flow from all of them and if there is any operation that will be conducted everybody will know uh, you know i can give you an example of the uh, Tudimbiri and some other incidences yeah. you discover some of the security agencies will tell you they don't they are not aware and which is not good for the for the nation and that is where the issue of the tinkering of the security architecture you know comes in mm. Indeed, I mean, if you just talk about Sundumbiri, and uh, we also remember the um, accident that occurred last last year, where the military accidentally uh, dropped the bomb on a community, uh, which was not their intention. And um, turns out, I mean, the air force was very quick to say it, it wasn't them. It turns yes. out that is the, uh, well, I say the air capabilities within the Nigerian army, and people have asked questions as to why the Nigerian army will have its own like having your own air force within within the army. I, I do not know if it's something that, you know, you want to speak to. But let's go back to the very beginning where you talked about the uh, Northern, uh, Northern oh, Senators Forum, which you now chair. You say it is to also foster unity, uh, you know, among senators. This senator has always worked as a family. Um, and I'm just wondering whether working as a family means that we continue to break into caucuses that you know seem to strengthen or reinforce regional ties like the northern senators forum the southern senators forum and some people are wondering is this really necessary i mean if it was around political parties they can understand but around regional ties does that really foster unity or does it cause even more divisions i don't think it causes more divisions because you see for example the both forums we have uh different uh, parties uh, it's not only APC you have PDP NNPP and so on and so forth uh, that fosters more unity uh, to my mind and uh, the whole essence is you have to champion you have to have someone to champion some of the challenges you know both the north and the south are facing for example if we come together the challenges I'm facing from my own senatorial district could be brought within the forum and we look at it as a whole. Some other person from maybe Plateau, you know, Quara, when they bring their own, we look at the similarities of this so, so, so that we don't keep, you know, bringing motions one after the other in the Senate. So the essence is to collate such, you know, challenges, look at those that are similar, deal with them as they are, and then approach our colleagues and say, hey, look, do you have things similar to this? If they do, then we champion that within the Senate so that we see what we can do, you know, as senators, uh, to push it forward. Yeah, because and, some of the outcomes of some of what we're seeing now, now I think the Senate has also proposed the um, establishment of a Northwest Development Commission. And people are wondering, oh, hold on. We, we saw the debate on how it went, because people from the Southeast were saying, oh, we proposed one, I think, in the night Senate, and it was kicked out. And uh, I think other senators said no. Uh, it was brought from the House of Representatives, and that it, it does appear that this, the 10th Senate is going to concur with it. But looking at how there's now a proliferation of development commissions, people are wondering, you know, isn't it defeating the purpose? The whole country might as well have a development commission at this rate. 
Yes, we are thinking about that. But you see, the challenges that uh, both regions are facing is what necessitated this. And um, you can see some of the challenges uh, are not being able to be solved by some of the governors within this region. So if you look at what happened in the, in the Northeast, for example, you really needed a commission to, you know, to step in. The same thing was done with the NDDC uh, uh, commission. And, 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 and I, I can tell you that the, all the commissions now were thinking of having, like you said, an umbrella so that eventually they, they get subsumed uh, into one national uh, commission, development commission, like you, you suggested. We're also thinking about that. But the challenges necessitated the need to have these commissions. Look at the devastation in the Northwest now, for example. The number of IDPs we have, the, the number of widows, you know, out of school children, the devastation, so many, over, thousands of villages have been sacked, as, as I speak to you. In, in, my, in my senatorial district, some of the roads are not passable. I'm not downplaying you the know, problems, so. uh, distinguished, but I, I do know that that's the reason, as my colleague has highlighted, we have local governments, we have state governments, and even some federal presence in those areas. So to now establish another commission just for the development, you know, we might as well have a development commission all over the country. Yes, but I, I just told you now, mm. we all agree, the local governments are not working, you know that. And it's, it's one uh, arm of government that we, we've been talking about it, the need to have autonomy of the local government. And that is something that the 10th Senate is taking on. Uh, like I said, all developments, both state and national, is, is, goes to the grassroots, which is the local government. So if the local governments are, you know, given independence, you, you will discover that even the issue of security you know, will, will, will become, you know, much less than what we have today. Let me quickly take it to security since we're going there already. Um, you already spoke to, you know, what the military is doing and what government is doing. But, you know, people will be wondering if, <clears throat> excuse me, we are really, you know, taking this issue of security very seriously, especially with regards to vulnerable targets like schools. Uh, this is not the first time that a school is being attacked especially in the northern uh, region of Nigeria. Uh, since Chibok was attacked uh, 10 years ago till about now, we've had at least 10 schools, at the minimum, 10 school kidnappings. Uh, so there'll be questions as to, you know, uh, have we really paid attention? Have we really been able to say no more? And really it has been no more with regards to schools, especially with initiatives that we've come up with, Safe Schools Initiative, and even directives given to security agencies uh, on maybe training teachers and you know a number of other people within schools to be first responders or on what to do in the event of such an attack. Well, I, I tell you, first of all, you should know, we've been in this insurgency for 14 years. And you can see that, the first of all, the army is overstretched. And uh, secondly, this has undermined the capacity of the police because all we are talking about is the duty of the police to do. So it has undermined the capacity of the police. And like you mentioned, all these trainings, I don't think they are going on now of, of you know, having the teachers to do this. And we can't say that in every school we have in Nigeria, you have to have some so, sort of you know, security agencies. We just don't have them. So like you said, the issue is about the citizens themselves, you know, understanding that they are also part of this security arrangement. And this has gone on for a long time. The Nigerian citizens don't, don't look at it that way. And we need to start advocating of the need, you know, when you see something, you say something. Uh, rather than taking, you know, some videos and start uh, putting them to trend. Rather, you should be calling the police. The numbers are out there, and um, it's, it's a very big problem, uh, you know. But I think as, as we move on, the security will improve. Uh, and I'll, I'll, the most important thing, like I said, is to see how these bandits can be routed out of the, you know, of the forest that we have. Because when they come to, you know, uh, carry out these, their operations, they have informants within well, the Senator, 
and like in my state and other but states. Senator, just just one second, on. if you do, if you don't mind me butting in, yeah, I sincerely apologize, uh, Senator, if you can hear me. You know, I I like the way you started, uh, what, what you were telling my colleagues, uh, saying that um, um, the president of the Senate told you and everyone that so long as you are a senator of the Federal Republic. You are working for Nigeria, not just for your state. Yet, you are from states. Every member of the Senate is one of three people selected by their people to work for them in the Senate. And when you say that we all know that the local governments are not working, you are right. But then why are the local governments not working? Is it because the Constitution disallows them from working? Because they worked in the First Republic, they worked in the Second Republic, they worked in the Third Republic very, very actively. Why are the local governments not working? Is it a problem with the Constitution? Is it that the Constitution says that they, whatever it is that they have to go to? Why are the local governments not working? Because as you also rightly said, that is the first line of defense for against insecurity in the country. Many people have said that, and you have also affirmed that. If the local governments were working, it would, it would probably not be as bad as it is now. Why, in your opinion, are the local governments not working as they should? Is it a problem with the Constitution? Well, I think if the Constitution is amended to make them autonomous, which an attempt was made, I think, at the Ninth Assembly, the biggest issue, I think, is, is the issue of uh, the constitutional amendment that, took, that you know, has to go through the state. I, I understand that when in the Ninth Assembly, when the, you know, the bill got to the state, I think about only five or six states were able to pass the bill. So I think the, the major challenge is probably, we could say, uh, the governors of the various states that we have in Nigeria, I think need to look at that as their challenge and, and the need for them uh, to actually, you know, uh, losing up a little bit to allow the, you know, local governments to survive. So well, I think you know, it is an issue that has to do, in my opinion, you know, with the governors that we have. And, uh, you know, I think uh, most importantly, they need to look at the, the issues at hand today uh, and the need for them, you know, to allow the local governments to function. And it will be to their advantage uh, if they do that. Okay, well, it's a long-standing conversation, Senator, and this has gone on for so long. I mean, president after president, governor after governor, all of these issues have come up over and over again. All they're supposed to do is to channel the money to the local government through the joint account with the states and not just for the, for the money to have any bust up at any point. But perhaps that's another conversation that we've had. Is there any conversation that the senators representing the states need to have with their governors so that they can also have this conversation with their fellow lawmakers in the Houses of Assembly? Because as you said, if it is the governors that are the ones, you know, like throwing the, the wheel, the cog in the wheel, perhaps there is need to, to have a sit down with them the senators to sit down with their governors on why this is important, so that, and the same communicated to the members of the Houses of Assembly of the various states. Do you think that is something that should be considered? Yes, I think you're right. There is need to have that conversation, not only with the senators, but also with the executive arm of government, with the federal government. Uh, there is need for the, you know, the president and the governors to sit together uh, and also, of course, with the National Assembly, so that we look at this holistically and see how we can make the local governments function. So, but of course, like I said, uh, if once we get the buy-in of the governors, and I think they will, uh, the, the local governments will, will do very well. Mm. Well, so sometimes... The conversation is required yeah. by, you know, the governors, the National Assembly, as well as... Uh, the executive arm of government. We need to sit down and look at it holistically because, like you said, it has been on for a very long time. So, and it has been, of course, uh, discovered that the major challenge is the need you, you know, for the local governments to have that, that autonomy. 
And I think if that is done, uh, it will go a long way, uh, you know, hopefully, to ensure that most of the security challenges we are facing, you know, will be, will be dealt with squarely. <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, Senator, sometimes some people find it very difficult to believe that the security agencies, with all of the trainings and all of the intelligence that they have and all of the skills and capacity they have to deliver, it's difficult for some people to believe that we that these issues are intractable. And I happen to be one of those people who have confidence in our security uh, apparatus in the country, the security operatives in the country whether the strategy is right or not that's another thing i say that because uh, in 2021 for instance then governor matawale of zamfara state said and i quote uh, you know when the, the, the children were abducted from uh, his state at the time he said that you know they were making effort while the state was in negotiating in negotiation with abductors for the release of the school girls other persons offered money to the armed bandits to keep the girls in captivity. This was in 2021, and the abduction was for 279 students from Jangebe in from Government Girls Secondary School in, in Jangebe. That's not the only time we've had such a comment from a top executive in government. We've also had situations where uh, even the Minister of Solid Minerals today said that there are some powerful Nigerians who are behind some of this insecurity, particularly those connected to illegal minings. We've also had situations where even the governor of, of Kaduna State at some point said there is a lack of collaboration of sorts among the governors in the in the Northwest, which is which also informed some form of um, illegal activity, uh, insecurity issues coming up. We have this information. We have this intelligence. Are they not actionable? Is it that these people that were mentioned, for instance, by the gov Governor Matawali at the time, who is today Minister of State in charge of defense, are they not actionable intelligence? Are these people too powerful for the Senate to invite? Well, first of all, uh, I would say please continue to have confidence in, the, in our security agencies because our security agencies are doing their best, uh, you know, in the face of, uh, you know, very lean resources that they have. And this is one area that in the Senate today we are looking at on the need, you know, to get them out of the envelope budget because uh, unless you fund your security then you cannot have security. Uh, you need to know that the, the Nigerian army, as it is today, to my mind, is the most resilient army in the whole world. If you know the challenges the army is facing, you, you will know that, yes, you'll be proud of the army that you have. So uh, moving forward, uh, the intelligence you are talking about uh, regarding those that are powerful, I don't think the Senate has the names of those people. And if they do, obviously, definitely, the Senate will invite them. So, but these are things that have to do with intelligence. And uh, when you say you accuse somebody of something, you have to have your fact, you know, before you prosecute him. I think one of the major things in this country that we need to focus on also is the issue of quick dispensation of justice. Uh, the moment we start doing that, uh, you'll discover that most of the, uh, the security uh, challenges we're having will go away. So, so people like that, that have been mentioned by, uh, like you said, the former governor of Zamfara State, uh, if he had provided you know, facts and figures to the security agencies, I, I'm sure they will invite them, interrogate them, and, uh, and find if they are culpable, and they will, they will prosecute them. So I think the most important thing is having the fact so that you don't uh, uh, have someone, uh, you know, being unjustly treated. So, Senator, as you wind down on this one, uh, we're going back in time yes. to your late brother. God bless his soul. So, it's, some, it's a matter that not many have had a chance to even actually talk about in terms of what transpired after all that hoopla. Perhaps you should talk to us. What was the thinking of the family? about how the country approached the entire matter? Well, uh, this is something sometimes that gets me emotional. Uh, the late president of Blessed Memory, I, I was one of those who nursed him throughout his uh, sojourn in Saudi Arabia. And um, 
when, while I was there, uh, every morning we go out to check, you, you know, we Google the newspapers in Nigeria to find out what is happening. So in one of such occasions, I, I saw around December 20, 2009, I saw, you know, the issues coming up about him not transferring power. So I was, uh, I was very disturbed because I know the late president. I grew under him. And um, I can tell you, uh, in our family, I was the closest to him. So I got disturbed knowing the kind of person that he is, that he left the country without transferring power to the former president. And eventually my findings was that, he, yes, he did. He wrote a letter. But of course I was in the army. It wasn't my purview to, you know, to come out to the press uh, to say something like that. So, but definitely he did transmit a letter to transfer power. And I'll tell you one thing. When the former president, Goodluck Jonathan, when he was acting president, you remember he sent a team uh, of ministers and the, the then secretary to the government of the federation to visit the president in Saudi Arabia. And uh, it was decided that we should bring this president back so that whatever is going to happen in terms of negotiation, knowing his condition, should happen in Nigeria and not in, in another country. While we were preparing to bring him back, of course we didn't tell him we were coming back. But he called me. He said, Abdulaziz, I, I, I heard you want to bring me back to Nigeria. So I kept quiet. Uh, myself and the, his personal physician, he looked at us and said, but you know, even a madman knows I cannot work. So we all kept quiet. Uh, just to relate to you the issue of him transferring power. So I believed if he hadn't done that, he shouldn't be saying this to me while we were bringing him back. So, but in our own, on our own, in our own way, uh, as a family, we did our best to see how, you know, the, the challenge could be solved. But for me, as a military man serving, it, it was beyond me. Uh, so what happened, happened. So I think uh, it is important for the nation to know this. And I think it is important also for you, the media, to try sometimes to do investigative journalism uh, to try to get to the root of certain matters that we leave, you know, we just sweep in the carpet, I mean, under the carpet. You know, this type of things, you know, rubbishes somebody's legacy. Uh, every Nigerian knows who the late president of blessed memory was. And um, those of us who are very close to him know that he wouldn't dare do such a thing. So he wrote a letter, but what happened to it? Well, I don't know. I think that is something you, you need to do, uh, even though time has been, has, 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 has you know, time has passed, but I don't know what happened. But I'm telling you, yeah. for sure, I did my investigation <clears throat> and discovered that, yes, he did, indeed, transmitted a letter mm. to his friend and brother, former president, good luck, Jonathan. We have to thank you for coming on. Uh, that's how far we can go this morning. Uh, Senator Abdelaziz Musa Yaradwa, Chairman, Senate Committee on Army and Chairman, Northern Senators Forum. Again, thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much, Timberlin. All right, Business News is up next with Ini. Thank you so much, Chamberlain. Good morning. Welcome to Business Morning on a Sunrise Daily. Yes, it's going to be about 30 minutes of business conversation. Of course, it's not uh, the impact of the insecurity in the country. It's also uh, affecting businesses, obviously. And so thank God that Sunrise Daily is handling that. But now let's do business. Uh, we start from the global space where Chicago wheat features were largely flat on Friday with the market on track for a third weekly decline on pressure from Chinese buyers, canceling shipments 
I mean, plentiful global supplies. Let's look at the number. We can tell you that corn firmed while soybeans slid. So we see wheat unchanged at $5.32 for a quarter of a bushel. Soybeans slid 0.1% at $11.94. Uh, uh, getting close to $12 there, but it's difficult to see soybeans at $12. You know, it's mostly around 11 That's for half a bushel. And corn uh, on the CBOT a platform is up 0.3% at $4.35 for a bushel for the week, which is down 1%, having losses for 6.5%. And in three weeks, corn also down 1.1%, while soybeans have uh, added nearly 1% for the week. Chinese wheat importers have cancelled or postponed about 1 million metric tons of Australian wheat cargoes. As growing world stock supplies drag prices lower, this news came after the U.S government reported cancellation of more than 500,000 metric tons. We've been talking of cancellation for about three weeks now of U.S. wheat exports last week to China. Cancellation of shipments by China, which is the world's number one wheat buyer, a heightening concerns among exporters over rising world surplus. We go over now to the oil space. Prices edge low on Friday, but were on track to gain nearly 4% for the week, and that's boosted by the International Energy Agency revising its 2024 oil demand forecast higher an unexpected decline in U.S. stocks. Let's look at the prices now. It's gone from 83 to 85 uh, dollars for 17 cents for Brent, even though it tapered a bit here, 0.3 percent. WTI also um, is up. Yesterday we were talking about 79 dollars, remember? But this morning's 81 dollars four cents a barrel, uh, but it's also dropped, tapered 0.3 percent. The gains this week have come despite the U.S. dollar strengthening at its fastest pace in eight weeks. A stronger dollar makes crude more expensive for users of other currencies. Also supporting oil prices this week where Ukrainian strikes on Russian oil refineries. You know, two of those facilities have been hit now in Russia. Uh, Costa Fire, the Rosnet, which is the biggest refinery in one of the most serious attacks against Russia's energy sector in a recent months. I'm talking about that report from the International Energy Agency, the IEA. It has raised its outlook uh, for global oil demand for the year in its monthly oil market published yesterday, Thursday. The Paris-based agency says it expects the level to grow by 110,000 barrels per day to 1.3 million barrels per day by the end of 2024. However, the IEA notes that the weaker economic outlook, efficiency improvements, and electric vehicle sales might slow down the growth. Meanwhile, the agency says the oil market might be in a slight deficient uh, rather than a surplus this year if output cuts by OPEC and its allies are maintained throughout the year. Well, talking about uh, the oil sector now in Nigeria, the Senate has dismissed media reports claiming that it will expose all frauds associated with the contracts and management of the turnaround maintenance of the nation's refineries. Uh, this is in reaction to a news report last week, a claim that Senate, uh, through its ad hoc committee on investigation of turnaround maintenance in the nation's refineries, has vowed to expose all frauds associated with the contract and management of the process. The chairman of the ad hoc committee, Senator Ifan Yuba, said he was quoted out of context. Now, responding, the GCEO of NNPC, uh, Mr. Milikieri, said, drew the attention of the Adult Committee to the news report and assured Nigerians that the delivery date of the Port Harcourt and other refineries remain sacrosanct. He assures that after the mechanical completion of uh, the Port Harcourt refinery in December, there is now 450,000 barrels of crude oil already in stock in it, and refineries currently undergoing regulatory compliance tests before the restream, and assures that by in the next two weeks, two weeks, this is what the uh, group CEO of the NNPC is saying, that the Potakot refinery will start operations. All of this contained in a statement signed by the Chief Corporate Communications Officer of NNPC, El, uh, Mr. Olufemi Shunayev. So we're counting down two weeks. We're expectant. Um, I know we'll be counting down for Dangote uh, a refinery also. Now we're counting down. This is the government's own. So if in two weeks the Potakot refinery starts operations and then we know when the products get into town, we can follow up 
you know, to see how that will affect uh, everything around supply and prices. And of course, the issue of subsidy will always come up around that. Now, I'm still staying in that industry. President Bola Tinubu has executed policy directives to improve the investment climate and position in Nigeria, to make Nigeria as the preferred investment destination for the oil and gas sector on the continent. The president has initiated the amendments of primary legislation to introduce fiscal incentives for oil and gas projects, reduce contracting costs and timelines, and promote cost effectiveness in the local content uh, requirement. Uh, this, of course, was re revealed by the spokesperson, presidential spokesperson, Mr. Angulali. And um, the president has also ordered the streamlining of contracting process to compress the contracting cycle to six months, application of local content requirements without hindering investment or the cost of competitiveness. Now, let's talk about this and a whole lot more with an individual who is active in that sector. He is the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of First Exploration and Petroleum Development Company, Mr. Demola Adeyemi Bero. Mr. Demola, Adem, uh, Mr. Demola Adeyemi Bero, good morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on the program this morning. So um, I'm sure, of course, you know about this. This is your sector, the president's uh, order. Uh, tell us your thoughts about it. Um, because sometimes when we have some of this, they sound exciting. But when we look closer, we see that, for instance, when it comes to the EL, the expatriate employment levy, we already have some laws and policies that take care of that. And so even though we get excited, the excitement shouldn't be in the pronouncements and the directive. It should actually be in the implementation. Is this one of those, you see? Well, thank you. First, let me thank you for inviting me to, to, to the channels this morning. I think what you see is continuous improvement. The PIA was enacted, uh, put in place. The law came in 2021. That PIA was not the only thing that was required. It required other enablers. And what you see in what uh, the president has done is building on that platform of that law and putting all the enablers in place. You've talked about fiscal incentives, which is really making the project we want to do bankable. So at the end of the day, they're major investment, and we want to get returns from them. It's improving the contracting cycle, like you've said, and just strengthening Nigeria's ability to be a preferred destination for investments. So I, I see it as continuous improvement. There's more to do, but it's putting wheels behind that act that was passed in 2021. Mm, so we, we, we hear contracting process here. <laughs> then we think of the issue of corruption, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, uh, a, a lot of the process you still need to deal with humans, and that gives you know, room for a lot of compromise. Mm -hmm. you know, um, have we started that process, perhaps, of putting technology or ways to really, about outside the paper, improve the the process, the contracting process. Yeah. I think what you see is, you know, this is an, uh, an industry that's major investment, high risk. And hence the need for you to make sure the contracting process is fair, it's open. And that's why we have the contracting process we've had in place for decades. But I think what we see is that has made us not competitive compared to other countries. So cycle time between a contract uh, that you want to issue going two, three years, it will make contractors disinterested in performing and coming to work in Nigeria. So yes, you may say that the corruption and all of that, but we needed a clear process. What the, what, the, what the government has done and what the president has done is they actually had a discussion with stakeholders. So they called the oil companies in and said, what do you need to do to make you accelerate your investments, accelerate your activities? They also spoke to the regulator, they spoke to NMPC, and then what they've come up with is practical things that puts into motion things we need to do. So shorter contractor cycle, ability to have higher thresholds where you don't need to go through a long contracting process to have your contracts in place. So I see those as enablers. For us as a company, it allows us to almost put 60% of our projects without going through a long contracting cycle. And that just allows us to do things a lot quicker. So you're good with the six months uh, uh, limits? I think six months is, is a good one. If it's one month, it's even better. I think what they've said is... Is it possible for it to be one month? It is possible. And I think it's been done. I think what you're hearing government saying is six months should be the limit. So it can be done in weeks. It could be done in, in a few months. I think the challenge for all of us is to make sure that we're doing it faster. And what it does is it gives contractors who are bidding for this confidence that when they submit a bid, 
they can actually get to closure on an award in a shorter cycle time. Mm. So um, we've had multinationals leave the same industry. Mm. So sometimes I, I, I ask, is it the, the end in us that pushes the local producers and, and you know, corporates like you to go to a place where international companies, well, in quotes, have failed and are running away from? So this is one, if there's one message I need to bring to, to, to this platform, to the audience, is this. The Nigerian oil and gas industry is, is the largest resource base in Africa. It's also an, a mature one. So it's not a young one which is in exploration phase. It's actually in development and in production. Typically, the international oil companies, what I call the big five, the big six, they like big projects, huge technology, long gestation, so major gas and deep water and all of that. So what you're seeing is that their migration out of Nigeria is actually not an exit. They're just going to their own turf. So you see them more in deep water. But let me share two things. In the deep water of the UK continental shelf, you've seen the exit of the majors and replacement of what I call the independents, the mid-sized independents in the UK. Same thing happened in America 30, 40 years ago. It happened in the UK 10, 20 years ago. So what is happening in Nigeria is not new. I think the good thing is there are indigenous companies who are able to step up, have the capacity and the capability to take over in the domains that the IOCs are exiting from. And that's what you've seen over the last 10 to 12 years. Mm. But in, in spite of this, we still need um, foreign investment. Absolutely. So how do we balance that now? So, so first of all, these three policy directives enable that. What does an investor want? He wants a good return on his money. So the fiscal incentives have actually improved the return on investment for this project. If I take some of the projects we have in First TMP, we're seeing a 20, 30% increase because of these incentives. And it's because government listened. Uh, when uh, Mrs. Verheiden was talking to all the companies, she was asking us, what will make you invest? So first of all, is the fiscal incentive. Second one is just the contracting cycle. If somebody is tendering to do work for you, and they're going to raise money in the banks to come and do that work, they want the answer in three, four, five, six months. They don't want it in two years. In two years' time, that investment would have left. And let me say this, we need to get competitive. We're not competitive compared to our peers, not just globally, but also in Africa. So this is about making sure that we have the resource base here, so let get, let's get competitive to get the investments here. People say over the last 10 years, of all the investments that came to the oil and gas space in Africa, Nigeria only attracted 4%, and we're probably the largest resource holding. So they need to change that, and I think these initiatives allow that to happen, just like the PIA gave clarity, but there's more to do. Let's, let's be clear, there's more to do there. Mm. And, and, and the world is, is harping on energy transition yep. to renewables. Yes. Where do you fit in? Well, look, first DMP, uh, and also let me say Nigeria, we have to be part of that transition. There's a lot of gas in Nigeria. We say we have 204 TCF. I think if you listen to the message from NNPC, if you listen to the message from the indigenous companies, the transition is going to be gas. Gas will be that transition fuel. But we must do two things. First of all, we must clean up our act. We must stop emitting in, in the environment. So what does that mean? Stop flaring, reduce emissions in our fields. And that's a program that you heard Total announce that they've gone uh, flare, flares out. And a lot of companies are going to do that. First CMP will be flares out by the middle of the quarter two of this year. So first of all, let's get clean up our act. I think the second one is let's now make gas, that revenue and, uh, and that transition fuel, for, not just for Nigeria, but for Africa as a whole. So, and what that means is the oil we have, we still need to develop that oil, accelerate the development of the oil to generate revenue for Nigeria. So when you look at the mix, there's things for us to do. And I think the focus that you see an NPC giving us the drive that you're seeing from government, the alignment with the global dynamics. I think we're, we're on that path to, to play in that role as well. Mm. Well, interesting you say we're on that path mm -hmm. and you say we have to clean up our acts. Mm. And, and we keep hearing uh, the world say Nigeria is more of a gas country than even oil. But the infrastructure seems to be the missing gap. Yeah. And that infrastructure is very capital intensive. In the midst of the, our reality today, <laughs> now the government has said they're going to, you know, the euro bond market, that's more borrowing, uh, obviously more interest that will be paid compared to the domestic one. How do you see us starting off this need for gas infrastructure? 
So first thing first is, I believe capital chases anything that gives good returns. So what we have to do is make sure that projects are bankable and they give good returns. Like I just said, these three initiatives given by government from the contracting cycle that reduce cost, from the fiscal incentives and the tax credits and the allowances they've, been, they've given, we are seeing roughly a 20 to 30 percent increase in returns. And that makes the project more bankable, more, more doable. And it, it will put that project in the financial services entities who are looking at it at a higher threshold for approval. So first of all, what government has done is the things they need to do. Make these projects, make this environment attractive to investments. So that's the first thing you have to do. I think the second thing is we have to get going. The IOCs are going to their own domain. I think my own prediction, and I've always said this in all for I've been in, is that Nigerian ind indigenous companies and an MPC, with the support of our regulators, will drive the gas game for Nigeria. Um, the internationals will look at it for export. We need that because we need the revenue from export. But the gas that we do domestic in Africa has to be done by the indigenous companies. And I would say we are ready for that. If you take first TMP, our plans over the next five years is to get almost half a BCF of a day of gas into the domestic and the regional space. But to do that, we need to make sure that we get the fiscal incentives, which these directives have put in place. Mm. So could you give us uh, some of those uh, incentives, you know, for real? So okay. So let's 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 take a, let's let's take one the, around the contracting cycle. Um, threshold has gone to ten thousand dollars. Before it was much. I mean, ten million dollars. Before it was half a million, it was a two million. We've gone to 10 million, which means that we can move faster in our contracting. We don't have to go through a, a long contracting cycle that involves our partners. That's a big one. Um, local content. If you look at the local content, you know, it was a good plan and good for Nigeria. It enabled companies like First TMP and service companies to actually emerge. But then we need technology. And sometimes all that technology does not sit in Nigeria. So we must be able to actually attract external technology, new companies to come into Nigeria to compete, and don't let our local content laws become a hurdle for them. So when you look at all those things, they're making all of these things possible. And then when you say fiscals, there's a 25% uh, uh, tax, uh, tax uh, incentive that's been put in place. Though all of those things, when you take the combined effect of, of those fiscal incentives, of, 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 the, of the tax incentives and all of that, I'm saying in our projects, we can already see a 20% uplift. And what that just does is it gives momentum to raising finance, and also it makes it bankable for us to, to run faster after all of these things. Mm. So there's a lot in there. There's ones you can quantify. But at the end of the day, what I always say is, is can you actually summarize what that means for returns? Because, you know, it's a business that actually has to generate returns. And when I see a 20% increase in returns for what has been given, it, it's, a big, it's a big plus for us. Yeah, a big motivation. So I'll just ask you this, because mm. you, are, you are in the industry. Absolutely. Because um, when we heard mm. that Dangote Refinery mm -hmm. will be importing crude from the United States, uh, we know that Brent, <laughs> I, I mean, from what I've learned, having conversation with, with experts, is easier to refine for our use and all of that even though WTI from the US is cheaper. And then Nigeria is supposed to be known as a crude owned company, uh, country, you know, and yet one of our own has to import. It's kind of heartbreaking, don't you think? Or is it just a business decision? So we should get emotions out of it. First of all, what I always say is that um, um, Elijah Liko Dangote and the Dangote Group took a big major step building probably the largest refinery size in the world and putting it in Nigeria. So big plus. That's big kudos to, to, to that entity and to that uh, company. When you look at refineries around the world, even in countries that have their own crude oil, just for the blend in their refinery, and I'm just talking generally, generally now, they import different sources of crude from different places. So whether they're importing from Nigeria, or they're importing from the US, I don't think it's an issue of, of uh, price or, or quality alone. Now, the objective we should all have is to make sure that we can feed the Dangote refinery with oil in Nigeria. The PIA already has some things around there. We will get there. 
And I think, uh, I think the dynamics that you'll see over the next year is all of that will ameliorate. But I would not say that he would not ex import crude oil from other places because you tend to blend to get what you require for your products coming out of those refineries. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I think we should get out of the emotion. The important thing is that refinery is here. It's going to serve the Nigerian market. First. First. Before. And it will. And it will also serve the regional market and international. So I'm, I'm actually quite comfortable because I've seen refineries in countries that have oil and gas where they still import different mixes for their own blends. I don't know particularly what their assay requirements are, but I, I don't see this as a big issue. So let's get our emotions out. Absolutely. Let's move on and look yeah. at the facts. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, the so important bit for him is to deliver products for us. Exactly. The diesel, the kerosene, and, and, and the, and the and other elements. And the supply pressure that we think. Ease the supply doing. pressure and hopefully you know, lower the, the cost of, of that product at the end of the day. Mm. So finally now, yes. in two weeks, Mr. Melekeri is telling us to expect that the Port Harcourt refinery, um, Nigerians, you know, we hold our breath when we hear some of these promises. What do you see? Is, is, is it going to work? Does it look like it will work in two weeks? Well, look, what I always say is this. Running the oil and gas business is a big challenge. And I must really give uh, Mr. Kilik, um, Milik uh, Kolokiri uh, a lot of kudos. Um, the dynamic nature of all the things they do. What I'll say is this, project execution and project delivery is something that he understands and he knows. So we should take him for the words and what he said. I am confident, don't forget they had a mechanical completion gate some months back. And clearly he's now telling us it will happen at this stage. So I'm confident that we should listen to him, but we should always continue to support them because project delivery in Nigeria is not easy. I mean, I always say we're going to deliver a project by this day. Sometimes it slips. I know Nigerians are interested. They're, they're, they're keen. interested. Um, but they're I'm interested sure, Mr. Abir, I'm I confident they'll you. deliver this. And also because the NNPCL told us they were going to be on the NGX. That's over a year ago. And we haven't seen them. So we're like, oh, what's going on? There's a lot on their plate. <laughs> There's a lot on their plate. And we should give them the time to execute all of this. The, the good thing is they have a very clear game plan they're working towards, and we should just give them that time to do it. We need that. the timelines. And I think they're telling us the timelines. He's giving us <laughs> okay. one for the next two weeks. All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Dimolade Emibero, the Chief Executive Officer Managing Director of First Exploration and Petroleum Development Company Limited. Thank you so Thank much. you. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right, now let's head to the market in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, we look at the NGX. We see that there was profit yesterday, but it was a slim profit compared to other days. But it's still a green market. There you have it. 0.05% is what we saw at the close of trade at the NGX. And then 58.83 uh, trillion naira is the market cap after gaining 28 billion naira at the close of trade sectors. Uh, we see banking, consumer goods, and industrial goods were in the green, while insurance down. Oil and gas has not made up its mind. <laughs> Perhaps they're waiting for the Potakot refinery to see if it's going to start working in two weeks. But we have Abdul Rashid Momo now joining us. This is our market prophet. <laughs> he looks at his crystal ball and the graphs and tells us where we are going to. Mr. Momo, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Hello. So, yes. Okay. So, we saw a positive week last week. We saw another positive. We've gone back to 104,000, but the profit is slimming out. Are we heading back to the bear territory? Oh, uh, well, you know, I've always said uh, the most important thing about the index was the 100,000 points. We are, we've gotten above the 100,000 points. We are within the 104,000. Resistance is uh, 106,000. Year market has been up for the past um, bull rallies for the past, um, I think, for the, for the I think for the past one week, one week plus, the market has, has been going up. So um, corrections are expected. But I think for now, this correction is a healthy one because I still see there's going to be another bull rally coming up. Yeah, I think when we, when we start seeing the numbers coming, what has happened so far is um in an in anticipation of, of numbers coming in, prices have gone up. 
Well, technically, what we are seeing now, it's a short term with three corrections and uh, with four corrections. So we are expecting a next wave of rally to the top side okay. coming up soon. And I, and I feel this time I'm going to bring the one around 6,000 points, which is I'll be the all-time high for oh. the index. So people should be patient. There's a rally coming up. So are you saying there will be a pullback before the 106,000 points, you see? Definitely, yes. No, no, the 100,000 points have been achieved. You know, the last time we were about, within about 98,000 points. Yeah. And, and I said the index needed to be in 100,000 points. So now the index is above 100,000 points in 104,000 points. The resistance for the index is 106,000. That's the main target. The so, bulls needs to break out. So, so do you think we will hit and the 106, think, that's resistance of 106,000 before the pullback? It. It's going to break it. Before or after the pullback? Break. This, this pullback is healthy now. Like The market is down now, right? Mm -hmm. People are still taking profit as we speak. The market is down by... Um, the market is down by 102... Wow. Point six points as we speak now. Yeah, and most of the index are in red. But the good thing is that definitely people are going to buy in strength. I'm seeing a, a bull setup warming up. So as the prices are dropping, I, I feel people are going to buy into those weaknesses. And I know there's still one more bull rally to go. Okay. So there's still one more rally to go. So people should watch out. Okay. So help us to understand what's going on with Mark the oil me, and there's gas. There's one more rally to go. Okay. All right. So what's going on with the oil and gas, uh, gas counter? We know that the first time the news came out, we had those who will participate or get product from the Dangote refinery. We saw that counter rally. But after that, it's been kind of quiet, either negative or unchanged. What's going on there and what can, you know, move that counter? Uh, well, definitely, you know, when things like this happen, prices always tend to move to the top side. Um, no matter how market is, there was, there's always bound to be correction at the end of the day. That's why, like, um, Seplat was a very strong stock then. As to speak, Seplat is on full. One though, that used to be I mean, a very ag aggressive um, stock within that period to um we, we are not seeing much rallies in those stocks now but you know as I always tell people we work within support and resistance level to actually give us the ideas which areas we are, what what will be our entry point and exit point for now let's say Oando now Oando is trending within um 11 naira to about 11.65 it's been on the downside, but what we are seeing now is we are seeing more systematic buying into weakness. And as I said, there's still one more rally to go. We are still going to see a bull rally in the market. And I think it will be likely going to be from the banking sector. As, as usual, <laughs> Mr. Abdurashid Momo, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and observations with us this morning. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll have more on the markets at uh, During Business Incorporated. That's 1 p.m. So you want to join us then uh, to get those details as well as other conversations around the world of business. For now, it's back to the Sunrise Daily team. Our next conversation, as you can see, is with Dr. Olusan Yawusan, who is a former SA public relations to President Obasanjo and Jonathan. He's executive chair of Center for Ethics and Civic Virtues, and he's also publisher of Nigerian Essence magazine. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Well, 
There are those who would wonder about what's the fuss about the Electoral Act amendments that's uh, you know, going around. What's your take? Uh, do you think there's any need for it at this time? Well, there is no document can, can be described as being perfect. Okay. So, amendment can come up uh, any time if uh, there's a need. You know, one particular thing, I think they want to make the issue of uh, transmission of electronic transmission of uh, result. I think that will help us in a way it is a, co a, con a constitutional provision and that is a must uh, for INEC. Remember that we have spent so much on INEC. And so the issue of uh, simple transmission of uh, electoral um, um, results, election results, should not be uh, really a big deal to, to, our, to our INEC. But however, you see, beyond all these provisions and all these things, is the fact that um, values is, is important. Moderating any particular political system is a dynamics dynamics and the character of values that are embedded in the substructure. And as you come about it, that's why you say the John Locke say men and women come together in civil society to seek right 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 to life, liberty and property. You know, all these things define what is a social contract. I'm wondering if there is a way to legislate values, but let, let's have conversations around, you know, let's, we'll get to those values and, okay. as you said, the underlying issues that they bring up. Oh, the underlying issue time. of uh, having, a, having a good electoral system. Yeah. Now, a number of other things that have been mm. suggested in that, in some of the other things that are being considered mm -hmm. in the amendments is the is in the process of appointment of the chairman of INEC, which is being done by the president at the time, uh, of course to be confirmed by the National Assembly. And then one of the other uh, issues is the filling of posts declared vacant by whichever house, be it the Senate or the House of, of Representatives. You know, right now the process is to get someone else into office through a by-election. Mm. But the suggestion now is that political parties should nominate on behalf of the community, that's the way it is coming out now, to fill that post instead of spending another uh, amount of money to uh, you know, get anyone else into office. Now, that might be based on the fact that it's not the face of anyone that is on the ballot. It is the icon and the name of the political party that is on the ballot. But it is that individual's name that is registered with INEC. What's your take on that one in particular? Look, when you remove the issue of choice, opportunity to make a choice, it's, it's, not, local, it's not local democratic. The, asking political party to, to because, because Mr. Ayo's party won the election, the last election, and you are living by either through one way or the other, that your party should now nominate. It's no longer a free choice. They, that people may have confidence in you. They may not, uh, we are from the same party, they may have confidence in you that you would surely represent their interest. They may not have the same confidence in me, whereas we are of the same party. Are you getting me now? So the issue now, the issue of um, asking the political party to, that um, political party to nominate another person, whether that person is known to the consensus or not, or whether uh, members of the consensus even like his face or have confidence in him, it's no longer democracy. But that, that might be a little questionable because uh, from the perspective of the law, yeah. who is being voted for? Is it the individual or the political party? Because it is on the ballot paper. There is no name or face of any individual. Mm -hmm. That fellow, whoever it is, is carrying the flag of a political party. So perhaps that is the basis of that conversation that some people are bringing up. Look, it is the party that, the, that is representing this individual, or rather that this individual is representing. So shouldn't the party also have the authority or the, 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 the largeness a permission Mr. Ayo, you know to what the, also you select know, you, that, okay, you, you know this what, fellow is no longer uh, you know, alive yes. or whatever, let's put someone else in. You know more than I do that there is no ideological difference between political parties in Nigeria. Look, look at, look at APC. Most of the leaders of APC today, some of them were even chairman of PDP yesterday.
You will have a situation where you will go to I am your supporter. We go to bed this, this night. Before I wake up tomorrow morning, you have already changed. You have already changed cap. So the question, this uh, this argument can only come true in a situation where there is ideological difference, where perspectives are different, and all these are methodology of uh, addressing certain things. Are no. Ye yesterday, uh, yes, uh, day before yesterday, uh, Alaji Atiku Abubaka, I said. PDP was this, PDP was that. He came back as a candidate of, 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 of that same political party. So why is the issue of political party there? The issue of political party is not there. There is no, there is no clear, clear, clear court. I am telling you, there are people who went to the Senate as a member of SY, SYZ party. When they came, after uh, the expression of the, of the other first time, they came back as, as a member of another party. What has, what, the, the name of the party has not changed. Essentially, for us, under the present, uh, the present situation that we are now, individuals must count. We must know your pedigree. We must know what you want to do for our constituency. A man who has been given the opportunity to represent us, maybe at the local government level, and he has not fulfilled his, uh, he, uh, he has not fulfilled his promise to the people. You now want to, because a political party it has a vacancy in the Senate, you now want us not, you now want to nominate that same person on our behalf to go to Senate. A man who has betrayed the people at the local level. Maybe even at school, as, as a school headmaster, he has betrayed his people. You now want to nominate him to go to Senate because the choice has been given to his political party. It's, good, it's not going to serve, it's not going to serve us. But, even, even as it is now, our elected people, most elected people, are they serving their people? They are not. So you will compare the problem. That's my own. That's, that's my own view. I know that. I know that a lot of people before the next election will leave PDP and go to APC. Some will leave APC and go to PDP. But they. Okay, so is there something then wrong with the law, with the electoral act? Do you think we should? Because one of, part of the, one of the recommendations, one of the provisions that that didn't see the light of day, mm -hmm. is in the independence uh, independent candidature. Yeah. We've seen situations indeed, you know, where it is the political, is the individual, the politician, that really gave life to that political political party. Mm -hmm. Governor Mimiko became governor on the platform of uh, the Labour Party Labor at party. the time, and. Uh, Labour Party wasn't as prominent as, as, yes, as it is yes. now. And then, of course, we've also seen a situation where the Labour Party presidential candidate gave life to the party only because of his own person, not particularly because of the political party. So are and you saying... And immediately he left. The Labour Party in London State went on ground. Mm. So are you saying then that we need to think, are you, are you proposed, do you think it will be a good idea now that those things are already happening, mm. that independent candidature should be, should oh. be a, a thing? Of course, of course. I was listening to uh, Baba Kolade yes, yesterday, eminent Nigeria. Can you imagine if somebody like that, he didn't go to politics because of the race, he said this himself. If somebody like that had been in the, in the Senate, many of them populate at the Senate, you know, they rank up, people will vote for them. People will vote for people like that because of their pedigree because of the love they have for the people and the love that people have for them. So independent candidacy is, 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 is a good thing to consider. Then, again, let us make it so difficult for people to begin to cross carpet each time they, each time they, 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 they are not given the ticket. Uh, yeah. A man who has been the vice president of Nigeria under a political party. You will agree with me that there are brill more, very brilliant people in, in this country knowledgeable, experienced, and with great wisdom. The God of God overlook them and pick you as vice president of, uh, of, of Nigeria. Ah, what will have happened that you now, with your mouth, I mean, I was in the, I was in, sorry to digress, I was in the convention where they let the people out. You know, I said, young man, I can't do like that. Even the little, the little position of, uh, I cannot go against the system that has, that, uh, uh, the, the, that has given me that opportunity. It is, it is, I will not. No matter what I want to gain, whatever a man will become alive, God, it is ordained by God, you will become it. Only the, that you need to work towards it. Mm. You don't have to destroy the system so as to, so, so as to get your way. No, you, as it is now, 
if we introduce this one, it's going to introduce, the end point is not going to, to be good. They will just bring it. Look, within the political party, it's because the ISB there. Because you know you are going there. It, it will be commercialized. I know politicians in Nigeria. They need to be commercialized. Mm. Okay, how about the... Do you see a problem with the process by which the INEC chairman is, is um, selected and uh, sworn in right now? Well, it depends on individuals. As at the time, uh, Ju uh, President Jonathan nominated uh, Professor... Um, I was uh, uh, Professor... The professor that came uh, uh, before this professor. President Jonathan did not know him. As Professor Jega. Uh, professor Jega. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, president Jonathan did not have any connection with him. He just people just said he's a good man, and he appointed him. He was advised by the party, one key member, advised, not to not, not to appoint him. Even there were prayer for him to for, for President Jonathan to remove him. President Jonathan said this was be and that all these things are beyond him. That is it, is the man going to do it well? He said, yeah, it's good. They said he's going to do it well. And he appointed him. And I don't think he has any, 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 any regret. But you know, individual differences. So it may be, uh, my suggestion may be that maybe we look beyond individuals and, and, and try to streamline it, have it uh, institutionalized in that way. This will be the process. But those sort of process, we must think, we must think about it deeply. Mm. If it is Nigerian, uh, because you know, people, if we want to say NGC, People are now going to stay our judiciary, you know. So that, is, that takes us back to fundamental public morality. You get the point. Not where you look at this day now, people have, have some questions to ask. And we cannot continue to go like that now. Okay. So in, 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 in effect, you are saying that, you know, all of these things need to be thought through properly. properly. But one of the issues that has also been raised over time is in the appointment of... Uh, 10 new INEC uh, resident electoral commissioners by the, the, the president. Past. And you know, of mm. course, the controversies that's been, and that's arisen as a result of that. Many people are saying, you know, some of them have sentiments for, for political parties, which is against the law. How do you respond to that one? Well, I don't think anybody that is partisan in any respect should be appointed into INEC. Even those who are not partisan, we still have problems with them. But the moment you have shown uh, preference for a particular political party, continue as the supporter of that party. There are other positions. Yeah, but when an umpire, you know, when an umpire becomes a member, when, when the referee, the referee becomes a member of the team, of one of the teams that are playing. I mean, your result is already known. Mm. But you know, there are those who argue that it's not really clear in the law for how long? Because these people might say, look, you know what, I left the party how many years, weeks, or days ago? And because I have left the party, there is no point, you know, I don't have any connection to the party anymore. That's the argument that some people might put up. But civil society organizations and several other Nigerians have argued with the fact that why should the president, you know, um, appoint anyone who no. has worked with a political party visibly? And sworn allegiance, so to speak, and some, to not, that not, not just party before now. Party some of them have been uh, PSA, PA, into one, one politician or, or the How, other. Do you think it is significant, really? The oh, fact that they have many, many members of a political party before? Yes, very significant. Very, very significant. Very well. Look, look at a lot of things that, like, that are happening. Look at the, the, uh, the election in uh, 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 Adamawa. Look at the election in Adamawa. We, we are, they, 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 not nobody is accusing the man that he, he had a previous uh, uh, allegiance with, uh, with a political party. But if he doesn't have a previous allegiance with a political party, look at the extent he, he went. Uh, uh, and now, assuming that he has a previous uh, engagement with that party, he has no previous engagement on, that is not on, it's not on the table that, that he was well, a member of a party, party. Look at the extent that he went. I mean, we should do, look, and uh, uh, you cannot come, come, come and Come on, the more judges in Kansas, you cannot be a judge in your own term because you come on, uh, the moment, the, mo the, 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 the moment you are, you are, you are partisan, there is no need to, for you to come and be a judge. There is no need to, for you to come and be a judge. After all, 
We are not short of uh, human beings. We are not short of good people, knowledgeable, wise people. They are there, they are there. Committed, patriotic citizens mm -hmm. who want, who can live their, uh, their life down for, for their country. When they say it's here, it's here. No matter uh, the, the, the number of cutlasses that you want to use to cut their head. Now, you, you talked about values earlier. Um, what really has values got to do with the law? We can't legislate values, can we? The ones that we have in the constitution, I mean, in the ground norm, they are there. Section 23, I see section 22, talked about our national values. One of them is self, one of them is discipline, and a number of uh, others like that. So, what, how, well, can we really legislate values? The, you know, the, you, can, you say you cannot, I don't think that any law that can be called law in its end, where if it's is operated under a system that where where anything goes. Are, are, you, are you getting my point? There, there, this, there must be a consensus, particularly in the, the uh, you know they said the issue of well is society is an issue of class struggle and then between us and abnos the ruling class there must be a consensus within the ruling class that no one should fall be, below this. At the particular must be there must be a limit. But now anything goes. So how do we, is there, do you see a place for legislating such things? That's the question that I'm asking. Section Already we Section twenty three of the mm. constitution says the national ethics shall be discipline, integrity, dignity of labor, social justice, tol religious tolerance, self reliance and patriotism. This is the constitution. This is the constitution. Is there a way to legislate around this to ensure that anyone who doesn't have these or any of these things does not get into office? Let me tell you. There are laws in our statute books. There are laws in our statute books. Are these laws, are these laws, are they being enforced? For instance, okay, there was a procedure, uh, there, was, there was a court case. There was a court case. And uh, they said, uh, the judge, based on evidence, gave judgment. They said, oh, this the judge has been promoted to higher, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to the higher court. So, the, uh, the, ju the judgment, not, on the, not based on law, but because the man had been, uh, had been promoted. But it was in that, he started that case as a judge out of that superior court. But before the conclusion of that, of that, uh, of that case, he was promoted to a superior court. And on the basis of that, the culprit, uh, the, man, the man that was alleged to have committed the particular case, is now going to go free. What kind of system is that one? That based on technicality, such a grievous offense. I'm not, we are not being particular about that, but I, I mean, that's, that's an example of everything. We just, what kind of reason? It then means that the purpose of everything is not justice. You, you, you still haven't answered the question directly. Do you think we can legislate uh, morals? No, what I'm saying is this. We have laws in the statute books okay. that can help us about all the all this, if, uh, if, uh, if fraudulent taking, uh, fraudulent conversion is still late. It has it, it, it has been declared. It has been clearly stated. You get the point. But to now have the discipline by ourselves, the commitment. How do you come about that commitment? That's, First the, point, that's, the, question, that's the question that I'm asking. Yes. Since the law say it, mm -hmm. and the reason why the law state these things is because some people don't do them, right? Yes. yes. Now we know that these things could happen. That's why there are laws yeah. and there are consequences for those laws. Yes. But the constitution is clear about these national ethics. Is there a way to legislate to ensure that anyone who doesn't have any of these things should not be in office? Now, let me tell you another claim. Is it possible? Well, that's, well, 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 you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I think it is, it is it, how do you examine, how do you determine whether the man does not, does not have it? That's the it question. Is, it, is, it is when, when there is an infringement. Okay. And the law takes its course. That's where you can know. You okay. establish where, okay, this man has been convicted of this, so it's not, he cannot go to this particular, particular office. But you know that there's that, also social mechanism by which all these things can be brought into the view. Okay. Well, there are so many issues to raise with mm -hmm. you, uh, Dr. Awusaya, you know, because you know, one of the things that you know, comes to mind about a thing like this is if we cannot really... Um, if you can't really bring it all down, 
yeah. you know, to holding someone by these virtues, yes, yes. then would you say that the law is effective or the law is toothless? Where the system can make the, the law toothless, where you have a, a system where immorality is very pervasive, where nobody has respect for 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 for, for institutional arrangements and all these things, mm. the, the law will be the law will just be in the, in the it's just like a, like a, like it's just be on paper. But you know it, that is also one of the things that many Nigerians see, and it makes them feel like not to trust the system anymore. So how do we instill or restore confidence in our systems, in our laws, based on some of the issues that you raised? Well, that's what, why, where I was going. Social trust. Social trust is the degree of believability that you have in your system. It is that that will promote in your art uh, presentism. First and foremost, it is, the, it, is the, it, is the, it is the it is the role of the leaders to create a situation. For as we are now, the, the major point, uh, the major crisis that we have now is hunger and starvation. If, first and foremost, before, before you can do anything, the clear question of answer uh, uh, hunger and starvation, you must address it. I do not believe all these uh, economics who won't always justify textbooks as a uh, market force business and all these things. That you cannot, if you cannot import rice, what on fried parts, you have uh, uh, meals all over the country that don't have raw materials to, 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 work, to, to work. Go and import that, and let's have it right. Look, during uh, 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 Minister Lauba Passenger, there was a case like this. Now. They imported food. We import food, you let people eat. Look, an, an hungry man, it has been said, is an angry man. No man will listen to your grandma if he's hungry. No right. man will listen to your grandma. It is at that point, now you begin to push values to them. When the system is responding to them, and for we move from food to water, they, they go to the, the public water, water is good, they will begin to, will begin to push that, uh, those values to them, okay. and they will respond. Now, Dr. Also, Men are conditioned by their socioeconomic circumstances. Dr. Also, just one last one, very quickly, and you have 60 seconds. Yeah. How, what's your take on how government mm -hmm. is talking to people, communicating with people, the challenges that we have as a nation, be it at the federal level or at the state level? The state levels are not even communicating with anybody. And I don't think, when we are saying Lagos and one, and I don't think they are even ready to communicate. And it's not their fault. Some of them don't know. They just, they just see the office and for personal aggrandizement, and for them to dance and all, all of this. But I think for this government, this government has a challenge of, of a re, in reality, a system that was totally, was not breathing. So we should, first of all, uh, it is not the, it cannot be the fault of the president or anything. Those who are standing with responsibility to communicate for government must buckle up. You, the, I always say it, the business of government is to explain, to explain, to explain, and continue to explain until either they assimilate or the situation changes. Because of that, there's no time you, you rest. You have to continue to, to, to explain to people. Okay. Dr. Olusaya was a former SA Public Relations to President Jonathan Obasanjo, as well as Executive Chairman of Center for Ethics and Civic Virtues, and also publisher of Nigerian Essence Magazine. Thank you so much for your time this morning and your thoughts. Well, uh, before we go, is there any conversation or communication from our people? Uh, Chamberlain and Malpe. who says the interesting thing about the row this session of the Senate over the budget pardon allegations by Senator Ningi is that almost all the senators that spoke agreed that there was budget pardon, but just that Abdul Ningi wouldn't have set it out. Okay, are you sure that's what he wants? Well, he goes on to say some of them said they are aware that some constituencies have up to $100 billion in the budget while theirs didn't get up to 500 million, but they kept quiet. This is bad and condemnable. Uh, some constituencies more equal than the others. While I agree that there should be discipline in the Senate against unguarded legislative utterances, weighty allegations of budget padding of up to 3 trillion naira should be thoroughly investigated by an independent body before a ranking senator like Abdul Ningi 
may be suspended if his allegations is false. Oh, that's from Dixie Neka. Look at this one from Olubamishi Bakari talking about security. It says there should be consequences for every action performed. The commissioner of police in Kaduna should go on suspension. The DPO should be on the road looking for a job by now. What the first lady said in respect of punishment is fantastic and should be enforced. Well, that's the first lady calling for capital punishment with regards to kidnappers. Wow. Well, uh, Muiwa has this one also on security, and he's saying bandits are getting bolder by the day. Communities are also covering up. How can 300 people be kidnapped and nobody is talking in the area? They took a path now or they disappeared. The, dis the security agency should arrest people in the area and even their chiefs, they will open up and talk. That's Muiwa. <laughs> well, there are different perspectives on this matter, don't they? <laughs> and they allow oh, yeah. to, because usually, you know, when 300 people really think about the Jimbling, that's a lot. That's a lot of people, you know, disappear within wow. the space of how long, and we're looking for them. Well, I think the military did say that they now know where they are, but that access to the place is very difficult. And when you think about these people trying to use them as human shields, mm -hmm. uh, then they really have to be careful because let's not forget, minors are involved in this particular incident. Yeah. But it's no excuse. We will stay on this matter until these children are returned to their families. Yeah, so we do thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week. I'm Chamberlain and Asaf. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. And join us this evening for even more conversations on hard copy. I'm Maofe Ogun Yusuf. And I'm Maya Makine. Do have a wonderful weekend ahead. business um, that sees um, itself going global will definitely need some sort of like boost.